I think Washington Heights and um yeah, cat a cat this cat Garcia, can't remember his last name, he got killed around the time I was writing that song. So I, I almost dedicated a verse to that to that that uh, that's issue, but um I managed to just keep it in there, just slip it in there really quick. So, yeah, it was an incident that happened in if I'm not mistaken, Washington Heights, New York. Cop killed a kid. A teenager. Um, so moving on to memory lane. This comes from a user named Isaiah J. Isaiah G, sorry. He said, um, so obviously you start saying I rap for listeners, one pants by ladies and prisoners, tennis and boys of all school. What do you rap for? Do you rap for the same people today? Who do you rap for today? Yeah, same people. It's a, it, well, I said I rap for listeners. That was the first rap, the line. I rap for listeners, bloodheads, still rap for bloodheads, fly ladies, of course. <laughs> uh, prisoners, of course. Um, yeah, yeah, word. That's... Um, on that same tune, obviously, you're, you're, you're remembering, you're looking back at your neighborhood, and... Uh, you talk about that, on that song, you talk about Fat Cat, you talk about Supreme Team, um, about Hustlers, Queens Hustlers, uh, from when you were growing up. And so back when you were growing up, back when you were writing that stuff, how did you view people like Cream, people like Fat Cat? Um, at that point, I, I, I mean, I didn't know them. I didn't know them. I, I speak about it the way they, they were spoken about in the street. You know, it was like Fat Cat. I knew somebody that was related to Fat Cat. I saw their life change because he was rich. I saw them go from rags to riches just because they were related to him. Um, Supreme Team, um, of course, that name was just huge, you know. Um, you know, it, it was it was a it was a rap song. Um, what's the guy's Malcolm McLaren? I think he might have made it. The world famous Supreme Team show. So you already had heard of that. So now somebody in this in the in the, um in Queens in Jamaica Queens had this name and you know Supreme comes from the five percent uh five percent and so you know you know there was a seriousness to it. And you'd hear about them all the time, all these da- guys that were um in that crew. And you know, you know it was it was serious. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you definitely you talk you said his name, you know, comes from five percent stuff and there's obviously a lot of five percent stuff scattered throughout the album. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's interesting, man. I, I mean, I got to meet Supreme later. And, um, you know, it all, it, in New York City, mainly, you know, what the 5% Nation was, was something positive for the kids in the street. And even the mayor at that time did, uh, was on the cover of the newspaper with the uh, with the father Clarence, thirteen X, um, leader, father of Five Percent Nation. They were on the newspaper together because of the work he was doing with the youth. He was doing more than the cops could do, and he was saving lives. So he didn't look down on a street cat. Whereas in Nation uh, Islam, it might you you can't play games, you can't drink, you can't smoke weed, you can't. He's supposed to be right and exact, 100%. So this this right here, he kind of allowed people to be them, but they had to have have knowledge. They had to gain knowledge every day, and that was something more that, that more uh, acceptable by the young, you know. So um, that became just the, the 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 words from you know the lessons became words in the street, like. You say word. When you say word to somebody, you say it. It's a part of saying word is bond. My word is bond. And you cut it short. Word. It comes word is bond. A word. You know, a lot of phrases come from peace. When I see peace, peace, you know what I mean? Peace out. That, that all comes really from so many different words. Come and then rap, rappers was using those words. And those words became international slang words. The whole world started talking like that, you know? So um, it's already it was already in me when I was a kid. An older God pulled me to the side and told me, "Not y'all, not the rest of y'all, just you." And He pulled me to the side and He gave you. So I got to give you something. And He gave me some lessons. And He's like, I "Want you to go over this and talk to me tomorrow about it." So everyone grew up. If you grew up as you was an '80s baby, you grew up with that in your life at some point. 
Okay, so on one love, um, you know, we just picked the first line with you know, what a kid, I know she was rough to hear a bit, but really this the idea, the question comes from this idea that you're writing, it's, it's almost as if you're writing to someone in jail. Are, are you writing to someone specific or across the different verses, or is it just this idea that's kind of prevalent all over Illmatic that you're writing to people that you knew who had gone away? Yeah, it's like a combination of people, so it wouldn't be that personal. So the names are real. Um, dudes I shout out to and all that's real. And I just take different situations from them and make it one story rather than, you know, five verses about all of them. You know, I just made it one, one song. Um, so on the same song, uh, a couple of different users actually asked us about this, two of them, Thomas Howard and Arobi, 1992. Um, you say, then I rose, wiped my blood to ash from my clothes, then froze to blow the earth smoke through my nose, and told my little man, I'm a ghost, I froze. It's funny, one of my mans asked me that when I, it was still just, just, it wasn't even done, but we should ride around and listen to the album while I was working on it. And he said, what are you, what the fuck did you say? I'm a ghost, I'm ghost, I bros. Yeah, my, I'm so, a ghost, I'm yeah. Ghost. Yeah, I, I said, you know, it, ghost means I'm out. Yeah. Um, we should say, um, instead of leave, let's breeze. In my neighborhood, I don't know if everybody else should say it, but, yo, let's breeze. Yo, I'm breezing. Y'all bros. So, <laughs> yeah, so, that's right. So, I wasn't thinking about, I thought everybody would know. I'm like. So, it's I'm a bros. No, no, I'm ghost. Okay. Not I'm a ghost. I'm ghost. I bro. So it means I left. I breathed. But breathed? Yeah. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> so, like. So Story. Story. Yeah. Um, so one time for your mind, which is maybe my personal favorite on the record. Um, you have the line, my brain is incarcerated. And over and over again, Illmatic talks about jail and it talks about Queensbridge. And how in some ways they might not be all that different. Um, when you were writing on that, were you thinking about the relationship between jail and your project? Yes, because it was um, um, a possibility every day you'd be there. You'd be one day hanging out, the next day locked up, whether you're guilty or not. So if you're standing next to your boys, you might be doing nothing, but your boys might be doing something. And or they might have just did something that they're not telling you about. And now I hear the cop car come with that victim in the back seat pointing in your direction. Or a cop thinks he's recognized you as making this for making a sale. Now he arrests you. Now it's you against his in the court for a direct sale. And you could you could have not been you. You just you probably had the same jacket your man had on that just made the sale and he left. And so any day, it could be your day if you're innocent. You know what I'm saying? So if th those are the conditions, it wasn't my intentions to write about jail like that. I didn't, I didn't want to write about jail. I didn't want to just, like, I'm going to write about jail. It was my vocabulary. It was my conversation. It was the conversations around me. So that's why it's always there. Yeah. Um, so I represent. Which is sad. Some yeah, sad yeah. shit. I think that like that was you couldn't escape it, even though you were trying not to have that view of this. No, it's like it's it's, it's there's forty six thousand teens arrested in New York City alone every year. That's more than any place in the nation. Between the ages of sixteen and seventeen. Forty six thousand. Most black and Latino. So, you know, you, you see what I was dealing with. Um, okay, so and unrepresent, you say somehow the rap game reminds you of the crack game. And you chose this line because now this sort of metaphor is commonplace, but I feel like when you were writing it, it was early on. So considering your immediate surroundings and watching everything that you were seeing at the time, like what did that literally mean for you? What were the similarities between the two? It's all about getting a dollar. Don't trust nobody. Keep your eyes open. Don't play with nobody. Focus on what you're supposed to get out of it. This shit is dangerous. It'll take you down. What's the difference between the rap game and the crack game? You know what I mean? So, and that was um, before, like, I, you know, I started seeing more entertainers get arrested after they got on. You know, I got arrested again after I get on. I'm like, 
how do I, how do I get caught up after I'm on? You know, so it it was like you know if you ride a nice car, you know what I mean you know what that is in a, in a certain neighborhood is you know you you looked at like you know you can get handled, you can get handled by people that don't like you or cops or whatever. It's the same thing. One of the best things on represent one of my favorite moments is you mark time by what you were listening to right before the BDB conflict with MC Chan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Time to yeah. Yeah. And that got me thinking, uh, obviously being from Queensbridge, being a previous generation of rappers from Queensbridge, um, how were the bridge wars experienced by people who were actually in Queensbridge? Because you referenced the bridge wars on that song. It was different levels. Like the old, older than me, they had known Roxanne Shante really well. They known Molly Marr really well. They were rappers from the older guard. They they were from the Africa Bambadas and and they knew about that stuff and they'd been to uh or was going to the clubs in the city, Latin Quarter, uh Union Square, the Red Parrot, um, all these legendary spots. Um that you be go you would go to and see live performances by Run DMC for the first time, Public Enemy for the first time. These that older generation they were they had a whole different outlook on the battle. They had a whole different outlook because it was Bronx. Bronx started hip hop. What's this name? What's this guy talking about? He started hip hop. That's that was the argument. Or what's this guy talking about? Queensbridge started hip hop. So that was the argument. Which so to me I'm like, damn, we got. My neighborhood out of everybody got a beef with the Bronx about where hip hop started. That shit was crazy to me. So I'm like, damn, this is this is really ill. So, um, you know, KRS, I didn't we didn't know who he was. Everyone knows him now, but we was like, who is this guy? <laughs> We really, we really looked at it because Shan was one of my favorites. So it looked like Shan had this hand, easy hand over fist. Um, no, that's the wrong phrase for that. But landslide, yeah. landslide. He had this right. Yeah. So when when KRS, you know, went in, we said, "Wow, this dude is amazing." And who would have known at that point, he would have turned to be one of the rap Mount Rushmore faces. You know what I'm saying? Like, he's like one of the greatest who ever, ever did this. But back then, we was all in doubt. We didn't, no one had heard of him. So it was exciting. Um, so on, I guess, the final one, on Any Hard to Tell, um, the last words on the song, and then obviously on the album are, Nas's rap should be locked in a cell. So uh, why your raps, not you? Um, and also returning to returning to the, the cell metaphor. Why my raps not me? Well, it was the the I blame the rap is guilty. Like it's it, well, no, put it like this. How it should be illegal that I'm allowed to talk like this. I can't even believe I got this free. This is what makes me understand the the the, the uh, freedom of speech thing. It's like wow, I didn't really really get it. I mean, me, you know, if somebody's yelling on a megaphone, you know, protest, protest, you know, this place is, you have freedom of speech to say these things, right? That's one level. But now I'm saying the stuff I was saying wasn't ever said before in rap. So I was like, how am I getting away? I'm waiting any day they coming to get me in, <laughs> from rap jail, rap prison. <laughs> somebody's coming, the Catholic church, somebody, because... I was saying things that wasn't said. So um, that's why I was like, Nas rap should be locked in the cell. Yeah, because shit is crazy. <laughs> <laughs> you have, uh, you know, on the, on the first two guest appearances where people heard about you, you know, live at the barbecue in the back of the grill, you had a lot of stuff that was really shocking on there. Right. Yeah. Yeah, so, you know, I was just, just happy that America is a place where we can say, what we got to say. A lot of people are scared to speak out on well, whatever the issue is. They're scared to say anything. You don't realize what your words can do. And that's what I realized while making that album. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, appreciate it. Thank you. Appreciate it. Uh,
If there's a question from the crowd. Right. I got a question for you, really quick. I need a rap genius hat. No, oh, yeah. <laughs> no, 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 no. You good? You good? You good? You, you got one? Who said that? Oh, all right. I need that. Oh, wow. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I got a two-part question. One is um, about the intro to Illmatic and, like, the inspiration behind that, like, offsetting the album. And, like, whatever, if you, if you just EP'd it or whatever, who put the track list, you know, together and how y'all arranged that track list? So, so you saying, like, the, the intro again? Yeah, the intro inspiration and the entire track list inspiration. Well, again, it was, um, you know, Wild Style movie was my was was really the first rap mu- movie. So, to me, I felt like there would never be. Thank God for Fab Five Freddy and the rest of them because um, I think his name is Charles Aon who produced um, the movie Wild Style. Thanks to them because they gave us a film that recorded the earliest stages of 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 this thing. And without this this thing. This, this movie, we would not be able to see what the club looked like. What being a rap star like Busy B in the movie, I don't know if you've seen it, he goes to a motel after the show, spread, writes his name with dollar bills on the bed. Like, that was balling, you know what I mean? And, and that was, and it was for back then. Or uh, the, the shotgun scene outside when they're about to get jacked. Those were real dudes outside with their gun that they filmed. He said, A to the K? A to the motherfucking K. <laughs> that was their lingo. That's they, there was no script. That was their gun, and they were really outside robbing people. So they were able to put them in the movie. So you get the, the whole vibe of the city, especially the Bronx that looked like a nuclear bomb had dropped off in there, you know? Landlords were setting their own buildings, and people were setting their own buildings on fire trying to get help. Like, this ain't no way to live. This, you know, you go through there, it looked like a battleground. So they recorded this shit. And, and, um, that's why the film is so important just on in New York history. And so it didn't Blondie's in the movie. You know what I'm saying? And she's like one of the first female rappers and shit. So I had to, that's it's too important. So so I put that in the, I took it off a VCR tape and I ran it through the console and we recorded it like that. So I did that part. Um, and then I sampled uh, forget the name of the drum shit from the movie that me, AZ, and Jungle are talking about in the beginning, are talking over that right. in the beginning. I sampled that myself. And I didn't know what I was doing. I just had the engineer, you know, help me do it. And and then we just sitting around with Hennessy and weed and, and everything else, and we just talking shit. And, um, yeah, man, it was it was like... Uh, so, so, so as far as uh, putting the album together, it was me. MC Search had... Had brought me to Def, uh, brought me to Columbia, and and um, he was after then he was like, yo, they want to sign you, man. Yo, would you mind if it went through my production company? Like, come on, let's get it. So uh, we did the deal, and he was starting to be a producer too. So um, he had beats for me. So I'm, I was writing to him, but I already had in my idea in mind. My favorite groups at the time was Tribe Called Quest, um, Gangstar. Um, of course, Lost Professor was my boy. So, um, and Pete Rock, CL Smooth and Pete Rock. So everybody's dream was to get a beat by Pete Rock. You didn't even think you could get a beat from Q-Tip. <laughs> like, all he does is try, bust a little bit here and there maybe, uh, you know, the Native Tongue crew, but you're not getting no Q-Tip beats. Forget it. That's a tribe called Quest. Don't even ask them. Yeah. Don't even play yourself, right? So it's Pete Rock. He was doing more beats. He was doing more beats for other acts, but um, they everybody was self-produced. I didn't. I I, I kind of when no ID tells me I I fucked the game up because my album's the first one a new guy with multiple hit producers that had never been done in rap. So um, you had you know Bomb Squad for Public Enemy. You had. Pete Rock for CL Smooth and Q Tip for Tropical Quest. Dre for NWA. They were self. Uh, uh, contained, it was self uh, produced, right. you know, so I came in the game like, yo, I need beats from all y'all niggas <laughs> and I was lucky enough, I was I was lucky enough that they wanted to do it and you know, 
I took a shot in the dark. But I had a way in, too, because Large Professor was friends with all of them. So he brought me in, and they were all, they were all mutual friends. So he, he made the introductions for me to Q-Tip, to Premier, to um, Pete Rock. So that helped you put the track list together? No, no. No, no, I did all of that. Right. I did all that. Um, when I was done, though, Premier helped me. I didn't know anything about mastering. So I was just, all right, I'm supposed to show up at mastering. I don't know what that is. <laughs> <laughs> I had an idea, but so Premier said, don't worry, I'll, I'll come through. So Premier, Premier got there before me and started the mastering. I got there, I'm hanging out with him all day watching this, this process. And he had all the patience in the world to master. He believed in it that much where he mastered the entire album for me. But yeah, I sequenced it and um, and, and, and all of that. Yeah. Oh. Um, I know you mentioned that you were working on this album and you were dealing with a lot of battles, I want to say, in my mind. Um, you were dealing with the street battle and then you were also dealing with the metaphysical battle and you were dealing with the spiritual battle. And I wanted to kind of know how did you decide which one was the one to like keep in the forefront? Like I personally want to know that because as a MC, I want to know like I battle with like trying to keep spirituality and mm-hmm. like, you know the mm-hmm. always having that home. So I want to know how you dealt with that. If you if you put spirituality at the front of everything you're doing, you're gonna be the spiritual MC. If you put crime or a street life in the front of all you're doing you have to be careful to balance that or you come off as just the street dude female so it's important that they can't title you it's important that because you want to someday do a street record next day you might want to do you want to touch the spiritual side you might want to touch the other side so you don't want them to say why are you doing records like this because that's what they would do to me if I made, say, a Uchi Wally or this, they go, oh, my God, dude. Like, I walked in a club one day, and, and I had a blunt. This is what I, and and um, this was 10, 10, 12 years ago. And I heard these, these girls saying, oh, man, he just messed it up for me. He smoked weed. Yeah, I would have. <laughs> yo, they were like, I heard them talking about how mad they was that I smoked weed. I'm like, I rapped about it back then. <laughs> back then, I rapped about it all the time. So I'm like, how, you don't really, like, so they saw something for me probably from a song where I came off as more positive, you know, but so they put, they started to trap me and trying to trap me in those things, you know what I'm saying? So um, just, just, just keep it broad, keep it broad, and it has to be balanced. Because a human being is, 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 is a lot going to them than just one thing. I really personally don't like too many people that only are uh, one thing. Because then they, they really blind. They're not, they're not really taking advantage of the rest of the shit out here. You're just focusing on one thing. It's like, it's a lot to experience out here. Right, last question. Hip-hop! 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 <laughs> How did um, you being around Rock Hill in, um, in the studio? And is it true that you did some of your demo during Rock Hill studio time? Yes. Um, um, when I when I met Large when I met Large. Um, when he, he, you know, he told me he liked what I was doing. He told me he he works with um, Eric B and Rakim and Kooji Rap, and I was like. He, how did he say that so calm? How do you, how do you, yo, it wasn't like today where there's like 20 amazing motherfuckers. It was like Coogee Rap and Rakim was those other heads on the rap Mount Rushmore. You know what I'm saying? Where there's only what, four, five? Four. Four. So that's dumb. He worked with the two. So he just said it like nothing. And he's like, huh? The three. <laughs> KRS one, yeah. I'm not there. I'm not worthy. No, it's it's. All right. Well, well. So, so anyway, he he brought me to the studio, and um, um, and he really was working. I didn't really see Rakim. I I, I saw Eric B. Eric B was the producer of Eric B and Rakim and Coogee Rap. So. 
you know, he, him and Large got together and he got Large to, you know, to work with him and, and, and Large just started lacing all that shit. And um, so I would see Eric B all the time. And um, that was cool to see because the, the, the studio was right near from where the, my, my neighborhood was, Power Play Studios. Yeah. I thought this place, I didn't even care to think where it was. I just knew Power Play Studios is where all of these records were being made. I did not realize it was walking distance kind of from my neighborhood. So when I got there and I see it, I'm like, it was this close all along? Like, it was amazing because I would hear stories about, the, 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 the you know, certain rap groups getting robbed coming in and I'm like yo it's like that like really <laughs> and um, I'd hear the names of 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 dudes that were heavy in the streets and then meet them in those studio sessions with Eric B and I, you know so Eric just said go ahead and work cause Rakim wasn't showing up so um, go ahead and work anytime you work he told Lars Presser let him work let him work let him work so I cut I was working on an album back then I cut about seven, eight records that probably Eric B has. I was 16. Right. And, um, um, yeah, so. That was like the demo version? No. These were, these, were, these, these, these were songs called Artist and Assassin. This was called 550 Fahrenheit. Um, another one called um, uh, something about female, something. Um, I had a few records. I had a few records, yeah. These were not Elmatic records either. The archives. Yeah, these were like some other shit. And I met KRS One there, and I'm like, oh. <laughs> Actually, no, I didn't meet him. I saw him there, mm -hmm. and to me, he epitomized gangster. He's on the front cover of the album cover with the guns and grenades and criminal minded. This is the Bronx, criminal minded, one of the best hip hop albums ever made. And when I heard him talking, he had he had a, a proper way of speaking to these white this white family that was there. He was talking to kids, and I was like, "Wow, that's like hip hop etiquette." Like <laughs> I'm watching, and I, I never thought he would talk like that. I just thought he's a murderer. You know what I'm saying? Like this dude was sounding really, really smart. So it, it's like, wow. I was like, I learned from that. I didn't meet him that day, but I, I learned from that. Like, uh, this dude is not a, just a. But you remember Scott LaRock got, got killed, his DJ, his producer. So um, I was just happy to see him still making it happen. Right. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much. All right. Uh, he got he got one. He's not. Uh, killed. All right. I wanted to ask, when you were um, young, coming out to the city, I know it was different artists from different boroughs. I want to know what inspired you to stay yourself, go with your sound, who you are, and you know, just keep pushing and doing, not even worry about all the other extra shit that you were just spitting your bars on the ground. I want to know what inspired you. Um, I guess if I want to do something, I want it to be right. You know, if I want to do something, do it right. Don't get, don't get ahead of it. I always say hip hop is bigger than you. It's not, I'm not bigger than hip hop. Don't ever get that twisted. Yeah. So once you remember why you got into it in the first place, it's not really all about you. It's about this craft that you have and this thing that you love. It's all about, I think, fine-tuning. I think all of us fine-tune hip-hop. You know what I mean? Each album, each song is just our new way of trying to fine-tune it till we get it into to perfection. But all of us stray. All of us stray at time, at time, one time or another. You go this way, you go that way. Um, yeah, it, it's, it's like... And I saw some guys before me, I saw when their style started to change, they started to get a little sexy on you. And you'd be like, <laughs> <laughs> you're like, yo, you know, and, and then I said, there's a way, you know, you could put on the GQ fly shit and be you and don't care what nobody say, but it, it got to really look like, yo, give a fuck. But you can't become uh, um, Aaron Hall. Yeah. <laughs> so I, saying, I know you were like young, so you you know, you got all these other guys that's already known, and you're like, okay, I'm going to take this shit over. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, that's how I looked at it. You have to have that feeling. You have to know that you're at that point where but you you worked at it, at it that long that you got it to perfection, and your, your shit's going to take shit over. So as soon as I dropped, I said, I got him. I got him. Um, 
And then, and then Biggie came. <laughs> Fuck my whole plan. I, like, I saw him coming. I saw him. I saw him coming, man. And um, when he got it together and they put out the Ready to Die, that changed everything because we weren't selling the records the West Coast was selling. Um, so Biggie and Puff, I remember Puff saying, nigga, when you, you, you have gunshots on your record, but when we done your gunshot, you're going to think that shit went off right in your ear, nigga. <laughs> you, 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 here's like the sound effects, you know, you, the, that shit you hear on NWA and all of that and all that. We're going we gonna to take it. And, and they did that. So that, to me, notori- the, uh, Ready to Die is our answer to the chronic. It's an East Coast answer to the chronic. So it, it, it was, and not to, it, it was like saying, all right, Dre took it here. So anybody else drops the album, we have to be there. You know what I'm saying? So he did that. So that meant that now the rest of us had to go even higher. It, it was we were we were pushing ourselves to go higher. You know what I mean? So that's that's changed today. But yeah, Biggie changed changed the game. He was a game changer. <laughs> Is it, is it uh, yeah, good. Yeah, I got one for you. Uh, so, like, it's kind of off base of, like, uh, uh, this a little bit, but there was, a, there was something you said when you were talking about, you know, if you're going to be a spiritual artist, you're going to be a spiritual artist, you put that in front. Uh, you know, you're talking about how going outside gives you more, you know, avenues and lanes. So, yeah. Belly's one of my favorite movies, man. Sure, one of my favorite movies. Uh, so, how was, like, your work, you know? How were all your albums and your work up until that point, especially working with another artist like DMX, you know, in a movie? Because I feel like that title really helped break artists into the film industry. So, like, what was what was that like for that whole experience? And like, how did your work go to that? Yeah, I think hype changed the game. You know, there was definitely you know artists doing movies before that, but he he made it his he played by his own rules. He did it his way. His cinema, the, the way he shot it to me is really amazing. Um, how was it working with, working with them, you say? Yeah, like how was it working with them and just like your works like before that? Like how did that kind of open up into the film industry? You know what I mean? Hype was such a, Hype was so dope. Hype was doing our videos. So Hype saw us from a visual. He saw us from a different side. We were just showing up to just, you know, perform in front of the camera, shoot a great video. If you had a video by Hype Williams, you made it, right? That's how it was. Um, so we go do our videos with Hype, and it was like a, a, your single was on steroids now. It was, you know, and so he saw it going even further. He saw it going into movies. And he, I hear him talking every while I got, uh, a while saying, you guys, are, um, you guys could be, do movies. You guys could do movies. I hear him say that every once in a while, and one day he called me, and he's like, yo, um, let's go take a ride up to these mountains and shit and write this fucking movie. And he, he already wrote it, but he brought me in, you know, to, to rewrite. And working, working, with, working with DMX was amazing because he had just dropped Get At Me Dog. I had heard him on the mixtapes already, but he had dropped Get At Me Dog. And the character he had wrote, he described DMX to a T. Before we even thought about it, he described them to a T. So, so the character was already DMX. So when DMX get at me, dog came and hype shot the video. He's like, "Yo," he came to me, "Yo, I got Tommy Bonds." Who? DMX. I said, "Oh shit, right? <laughs> yes, right." So working with X was ill because we bonded like brothers on 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 the set. I didn't know what he was going to be like. I, I I knew that he was changing rap, the rap game. Um, I didn't know what he was going to be like personally. And, and, and dude was immediately, I said, this is one of the smartest dudes I ever met in my life, DMX. Like, like that, that fast, just from the way his mind works, the way he talks, what he talks about. Um, and um, so Hype used to always be on me, though, on that movie. Um, Yo, Nas, man, you know, you got to really do more. Uh, we're going to have to take you out the movie. <laughs> Yo, Nas, you're going to have to really tone it down a little bit. Uh, you know, the producers ain't really feeling it. Yo, Nas, you know, I, I, that scene, you're not really doing it for everybody. He used to be on me. Bad. Like, 
pushing me, pushing me, pushing me. But he made me nervous as fuck because <laughs> I'm like, I got the scene. The scene is, is easy. I know the scene in my sleep. But he's on me like a cheap suit. He's like, yo, yo, dog, you really ain't making me believe you. Know? <laughs> but maybe because X was so good. But I feel like you guys both complimenting each other. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Because I got a friend back home that's like, crazy like DMX but you know we're good friends because you know because I'm the cool calm collective right the, oh, I'm out of this world <laughs> right everybody knows somebody like like, <laughs> like that. yeah, yeah. yeah. actually let me bring one thing up because I spoke to you about it um, before like just off the contrast of people's personalities I'm about to tell you like how Buster was just talking about you and how y'all could like people that don't know you because we don't know you personally it's like you're more reserved and then they're like X, Buster, or right, 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 right. Regular, how does that, is that the type of people that you match with on a regular, or is this, <clears throat> it's something about them personally that just draw you to their personalities, like how X, you said he's most intelligent in the way he talks, what was it about, like, Buster? X, X, X is a totally, a total street dude. Um, X is a total street dude, dude, he's brilliant. That dude is brilliant, you, you know, if you talk to him, you know, you, you'd be like, wow. Um, Buster is such a, a good spirit. Buster's like a good, you know, that one of those guys that just brings that energy to you, like not not hyper hyper energy, but when he's talking to you, but just good good everything. Like he's, he's encouraging. He talks to you like, and I see him do that with everybody. Everybody I, I, I've seen Buster deal with, you know, is never on no phony. He's always showing people love. I think that's one thing that stands out about him. He'll go on stage with you and take the microphone and tell, tell the audience how much they should appreciate you. I see him do this for a lot of people because he loves the culture. And he's someone who stood the test of time. You know, so I, I take my hat off to Buss. So there's a lot you can talk to him about. He's, he was in a group signed before I was, you know, um, putting out records, you know. So he's been in the game that long. So I like talking with people that's been in the game that long. I talked to Eric B, and um, he's you know he tell you about things that make you understand why they, things are the way they are now. So I, I love talking with everybody that got that wisdom. Thanks, everyone. Ah. Uh, <laughs>